So Professor Joseph Macari is going to present again on the issue of uh, entrenchment of managers. And I will invite Professor Richard Saito from Fundação Getúlio Vargas uh, Business School. Uh, I'm very glad that he is here. He has got his Master of Science in Engineering and his PhD in Engineering in Economic Systems, both from Stanford University. And he teaches um, finance and project finance and corporate finance at the business school. Thank you. I, I feel like it's a wedding. You get to actually give your own uh, speech. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, I didn't plan it this way. Uh, usually the, these people uh, I know as co-authors are fairly reliable, uh, at least until uh, you ask them to give their draft. Uh, okay. um, so this is a paper with uh, Mark Humphrey Jenner, and we've been working on the question of managerial entrenchment, and the issue for us is whether, in fact, uh, entrenchment destroys value. So in terms of the motivation, there's quite a bit of literature on entrenchment and the value effect. Um, and clearly the question for us is, and it's a live issue, is uh, why entrenchments associated with value destruction? Um, there's quite a bit of research that's been done earlier to show that firms with entrenched managers certainly have lower market value. And clearly there's the uh, Gumper's Ishii Index, the Bebchuk uh, Slim Down Index, where essentially uh, the number of ATPs, 24 versus 7, in a charter uh, proxy the quality of governance for a firm, and we know that, in fact, <coughs> the firms with uh, more ATPs, at least in terms of the early Gumpers and uh, Bebchuk <coughs> index, um, have worse uh, returns, and uh, certainly there's been extensions, and the first extension that's uh, one that we relate to in this paper is Mosulis, uh, and Mosulis uh, certainly in a, a U.S. study shows that, in fact, entrenched managers make more value-destroying investments in the context of the market for corporate control. Um, so there's a, a strong relationship between governance um, and we know the price of debt. And the question we were really looking at in this paper <coughs> is what are the so-called uh, effects of entrenched managers um, on the so-called indirect costs of debt? So that's the issue in this paper. So we know that some types of governance are associated with uh, uh, particular uh, harmful situations. So we know that debt terms, uh, I mean, this is quite clear what I mentioned before. Um, and there's quite a bit of literature that's followed up both from corporate finance, uh, Chava's study clock. And uh, we also know that there's uh, related work in terms of governance and credit ratings. So there's quite a bit of so-called dispersed work out there about the role of governance in debt. Uh, certainly on just uh, the relation between takeover vulnerability and uh, the quality of governance and certainly credit ratings. So we decided to actually look at a question in terms of the relationship between uh, poor governance, uh, the price of debt, uh, the quality of credit ratings, and the terms that companies get. That is to say, uh, the terms for raising capital. So the research question is, how does so-called poor governance destroy value? And what's the consequence of it in terms of fees and credit ratings? So these are what we call the indirect uh, so-called costs of high entrenchment of managers. Um, and so the, what we're looking at here is um, how does governance drive destruction in these particular ways? So is it more expensive for firms that are poorly run uh, to raise capital in the debt markets? Um, and is it reflected in both the credit ratings and the number of covenants, okay? So we looked at 9,000 debt instruments over a long period uh, uh, to examine whether or not, in fact, there's this relationship between governance and debt terms. Um, but we're also looking in terms of the effect on spreads. And we're talking about spreads, we're actually looking at the tranches. And so, for example, a spread might be if it's a Euro LIBOR, um, and 245 basis points for a tranche A spread. So we're talking about spreads in terms of basis points on the tranches. It's not the bid ask with respect to a simple equity transaction, okay? 
And then we're looking at the cost besides the spreads, which would be the credit rating and the other costs of, let's say, a non-investment rated uh, party. Okay? And they would have a higher cost of raising capital, particularly if it was the first time they raised capital. So what we're investigating is the impact of the legal factors. That's the legal part of this paper. The impact of the legal factors on the cost of raising capital. So the key thing is then looking at, in fact, the so-called issuer controls on the one hand, but also uh, the typical financial questions with respect to leverage, uh, firm size, token queues, uh, earnings, and so forth. So there's quite a bit of early research on this, as I mentioned. Um, I don't think we have to spend too much time, but in fact, most of it's actually looked at uh, the a relationship between shareholders and debt holders and the quality of governance. The lead paper in this literature is the Kramer paper. Uh, you could say all the other papers are footnotes. They look at the direct cost of raising capital. Um, paper that we're looking at is indirect costs. Um, measures, we're looking at the anti-takeover provision. So we, um, you might just say uncritically, if you want to be clear about it, anticipate some criticism already, um, is that we're uncritically going to take uh, the Jim index and the B index um, and use that as essentially uh, what our measure is. Um, and this is clearly the same measure that most other studies have used. Uh, and clearly when we see a higher level, that is to say uh, a gym of 10 as opposed to 1, we'll have a very clear idea of the type of firm we're talking about. So in terms of controls, we look at the characteristics, as I mentioned before, uh, that is to say uh, that may be important in terms of uh, the impact, as well as the firm characteristics, which I mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of the data source, this is just a simple uh, off-the-shelf. Any graduate student can do this themselves uh, with respect uh, to the two proprietary databases. So there's a, only a little bit of hand backfilling where the years in question are not available in the database, and we've done that uh, with respect to the following years where um, the reported data is for these following years, we've backfilled the data for the entire period of 1990 to 2009 ourselves. So we have the provisions. Uh, we use the GIM index. They're only for firms incorporated in Delaware. We've actually looked for firms not incorporated in Delaware, and we have pretty much the same effect. So the Delaware effect um, is not really um, uh, contested, and certainly we're looking at the so-called issues, um, as I mentioned earlier. So the general findings, just to make the paper go quicker, as opposed to listening to me too much, uh, these are the general findings. <laughs> Um, so the paper in the slide um, is that, well, the prediction would be firms with wor worse governance, so an index of at least 10, uh, or BCF of 3. Well, clearly we know that firms with poor uh, governance will have uh, higher fees, both pre- and post-fees, i.e. their spreads or the gross spreads and their selling concessions uh, will be uh, essentially against or more deleterious. Uh, we'll see many more restrictive covenants, and their credit ratings will be worse. Now we'll just go through and uh, quickly because I don't want to waste too much of your time. I'll give my discussant, I think, uh, most of the time uh, having to, I know what it's like as a teacher having to listen to someone, someone for a long time. Um, so here are the summary statistics. And as I said here, with respect to uh, the gross spreads and the selling concessions, uh, they're both significant and uh, probative, uh, certainly with the uh, uh, GIM of 10 and also with th uh, BCF of 3. And it's five of six with respect to the selling concessions and certainly uh, with respect to uh, at least the spreads, the gross spread. So clearly, we see it into both the spreads, the concessions, and along the so-called three uh, indices for credit uh, rating. So it's fairly significant across the board. It's a robust uh, conclusion. Um, and in this respect, we can say that uh, you know, in this respect, governance matters uh, for debt markets. Okay, so the other market we were talking about earlier were equity markets, but for debt, creditors have a different uh, preference and sensitivity, and clearly, uh, as you can see, uh, they sort out uh, the companies they wish to hold uh, investments in. Now, arrangement fees, this is in fact the so-called key takeaway from our paper, is it's these so-called pre-fees, that is to say, uh, fees for arrangement that really matter. And ultimately, in fact, if you look at these so-called issuer variables, I think the key thing uh, is that where there's variation in issuance, that is a type of bond, then the actual conclusion about poor-rated firms doesn't flow through. 
because of this nature of the market. So there's some variable coupon issues which will have lower fees or zero coupons will have differentiated fees. So if you slice out the so-called variations in the markets for type of issuance, you still get a strong correlation and a strong conclusion with respect to our prediction. So it's very strong at the 5% for uh, the three areas I mentioned, but some variation across the markets with respect to the type of actual issue concern. And that makes uh, quite a bit of sense. Um, what we don't take is a so-called so um, yeah, absolute uh, measure on this uh, because we haven't taken that into account. Um, and you can see in terms of the fee regressions, uh, same thing in terms of the growth spreads and the selling concessions, both for the GIM plus 10 and the BCF plus 3, um, where you, in fact, have a very strong uh, outcome. Uh, for the covenants, we predict, obviously, higher use of covenants. Uh, why? Because, in fact, we have the early warning covenants that uh, give investors some indication about financial uh, despair or eventual despair. We also have restrictive covenants with respect to investment um, and other covenants with regard to um, management governance, uh, where the firm is actually closer to going uh, insolvent, where, in fact, there's a governance uh, element into the covenant. So what we see here is that there's more restrictive uh, covenants. Um, uh, where we see worse governance, it's at the 1% significance, and we also see larger placements uh, are likely also to uh, use uh, more covenants. One thing's important to differentiate, though, this market's the public bond market, the 144A market. So if you look at uh, the work that's been done in the field, we know that there's fewer covenants in this form of debt than the typical bond covenants, or at least the bank-based covenants you see uh, issued by syndicates in New York. So the two type of markets, and this market, the 144A market, has significantly less uh, so-called covenants, FOI and others in JF uh, 2005. And the reason it's articulated along those lines is that the arranger reputation, that is to say the better arrangers that select firms with, let's say, higher credit ratings, uh, will effectively be the ones that have firms with lower covenants, uh, tighter so-called spreads, and better returns. So this market, as you see in the data if you look at it, seems to be a higher valued market, but across the period of 1990 to 2009, you actually see an interesting phenomenon, which is declining quality of issuers. So in fact, by the end of the period, there's very few, thank you, um, triple A's in this market. So uh, this so-called differentiation between the syndicated loan market of banks and the 144A loan market seems to actually be converging in a much more radical way than we anticipated. So at least our prediction shows that there's more uh, likely to be covenants uh, in firms that are poorly uh, managed. Uh, you can, see, can certainly see that. Uh, I, we don't have it broken down with respect to what type of covenants, but in fact, in the slice of the data, we actually have sliced out the covenants, and it's the early warning covenants and restrictive covenants on investments are the ones. Leverage, in fact, if we talk to Margaret today, um, we see, in fact, uh, leverage ratios, which are, of course, part of the early warning covenants, are one of the top ones that are actually uh, in the uh, mix of uh, the data. So what about credit ratings? Um, we don't use a so-called aggregate rating like uh, Altman Z. We could have done that, but we didn't. We just took standard credit ratings, um, and certainly, uh, uh, as you would expect, because effectively uh, firms with poor governance have more uh, so-called covenants, you're likely to see that, in fact, uh, the ratings would actually be proxied for that. And we see that, obviously, across uh, the issues, large issuers uh, having a different rating than uh, the uh, zero coupons and others, but that's clear from the earlier slides. And this is across the board, uh, both for the Moody's, the S&P, and Fitch. You would assume that Fitch would actually break out and be the more stringent, but in fact, if you look at the regressions, uh, it's actually almost identical, and who would think that would happen? Um, but in any event, uh, so it's very robust with respect to the credit ratings. And for the credit overall, in terms of the uh, ratings, they're by individual issue. And what we're talking about here is tranche by tranche. Not the entire tranche, but the single tranche. And we're looking at the ratings of the individual tranche itself. That is to say, there could be some variation across the ratings of the firm if we actually uh, put the full tranche together. But here what we've done is disaggregated it and just looked at the quality of the actual uh, raising of the debt by tranche and the individual rating itself. And so here we have one observation for each firm. 
and the variable is just the credit rating. And in that respect, um, it's gym index driven. So if we were to do it differently, which we can, is to put it all together, aggregate and have a tranche, and see whether in fact it comes out. We can do that, we haven't. Um, and certainly uh, it comes out with the same result as I had in the other slide. So what can we learn from this? Well, it's a pretty simple story, I think. Um, governance matters here um, <laughs> in the sense that uh, entrenchment induces worse debt terms. And what we're looking at, in fact, are the indirect cost on fees and the cost in raising additional capital with respect to um, when firms actually go back in the market. What we haven't logged for is in terms of the delay in terms of raising new capital and the effect on the credit rating. We could do that. So if you looked at the logged uh, so-called date for the delay in raising new capital, we would see that the cost would be actually increased. We haven't resulted, put the results in the paper here. So in fact, there's a higher cost because firms with lower ratings uh, have more difficulties going to the market. And poor governance then has this penalty of the terms. Um, ultimately, the rating agencies, we think, get it right in terms of these type of bonds because these are not complicated forms of so-called securities. It's very simple to actually rate them. Uh, and as a consequence, this might be the one part of the credit rating puzzle. And certainly, this is what most of the data indicate that uh, we didn't have a problem through this so-called period of 2007 and 8, where ratings were so-called at uh, variance with fair value. We know from the Altman Z index that, in fact, they were very close to fair value. So we shouldn't be too worried about adding any additional so-called signifiers on the rating, because these are non-complex securities of uh, ordinary type, uh, where we wouldn't need to put too much extra skin in the game. Okay, so here, prior studies, and this is consistent with that, uh, reduce firm value where there's too many ATPs. Uh, clearly, we show this is a new dimension, which is to say that uh, firms, and we've actually disaggregated and re-aggregated uh, the ATPs ourselves, and it's very clear that it doesn't matter that you actually have so-called variations in the anti-takeover provisions by state or jurisdiction. By re-aggregating, we still get the same output in terms of the effect on uh, so-called costs. So it really doesn't matter that the gym index is used this way or disaggregated, re-aggregated way. And ultimately, we think that in terms of the value destruction, firms that continue to adopt these so-called practices will pay, extra will pay extra costs, deterring them from going into the market at a rate that their shareholders prefer, uh, making it more costly in terms of both the fees, but also the period of time in which they want to raise new capital. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a very nice paper. Uh, I have. Uh, so let me give a first uh, kind of a general overview on the paper. Uh, the paper is to analyze the impact of money manager entrenchment on the cost of debt. And by arguing that, you know, uh, poor uh, governance companies, they actually they have incurred in higher cost of debt, and that what would imply uh, lower valuation. And. Uh, uh, Joseph and his author, they use the data source, uh, secondary, uh, mergent, and CRSP. Uh, they came up with a very nice uh, data set of uh, over 9,000 uh, debt instruments. And they basically use the uh, proxy, proxy for G index and uh, the B index for manager entrenchment proxies. Uh, on the methodology, they basically use the OLS. Uh, <coughs> they basically regress. Uh, the three major uh, components, uh, the, the items on the cost that they would like to see, which are fees, uh, the, the covenants, or dummy for covenants, and uh, the credit rating, which is one for triple A and uh, no, one a dummy for yes uh, for, for covenants. And you know, they basically confirm that basically uh, you know, the higher, the poor governance, uh, it seems to higher higher debt, cost of debt the covenants and the, the lower credit ratings. I wanna, I wanna <coughs> discuss on the higher fees uh, because I wanna argue on the, on the fees versus the spread, which was not quite clear in the paper. First one is on the paper setting. I think it's a good argument for the manager entrenchment impact on the cost of debt. You now we've seen that uh, quite a lot. And uh, actually, um, the authors are quite right uh, because you know most of the papers have focused on the on the equity uh, or the shareholders and managers <laughs> side, and not too much on the debt side. 
<coughs> but but I want to argue two things which are quite important, which uh, which I've seen uh, there are quite a lot of uh, papers which uh, have been discussed about the debt issue. First one is a uh, short-term debt and long-term debt. The focus of this work is on bonds, which means long-term debt. But you know, I've seen a lot of papers discussing the you no. Know, no, I if you have a poor governance, it's better to have long-term debt because you basically can spread the, the installments over time. But the short-term debt, if, it, if it, there is a risk of, of no, uh, refinancing the cost of short-term debt, you know, if you have a poor governance kind of uh, company, you might not be able to, to refinance the short-term debt. That's one point. And the second point, uh, uh, the, the paper is basically focused on, on bonds. But be before going to the debt capital markets, uh, probably the company has gone through bank loans. And you know, uh, so which one is the better monitor for uh, the company? Bank loans, they take a much uh, you know, uh, a stricter role in monitoring the company, while debt capital markets for mature companies. So we are talking about two different instruments with two, you know, uh, basically, uh, he, he's focusing on 144A kind of market. Uh, so, you no, know, I, I would like to um, give an example because some, some companies before going to equity IPO, they actually go to the debt IPO just to tap the markets where, you know, the, probably the funds like a Temple to Fidelity, all, all these kind of investment funds, they basically uh, get, need to get to know the company and some companies, they do uh, have a strategy to tap the debt ma capital markets before going to the <coughs> equity capital markets. <coughs> so I think these are, you know, these are two things which uh, I think uh, um, I, I miss in the paper. And the, the second thing is on the setting of managerial entrenchment. What does managerial entrenchment mean? And would that be, uh, would the two index, the uh, GG index or the B index would be very good? to proxy the managerial entrenchment? Well, to a certain extent, yes. You know, the literature has been doing so. But, uh, you know, for, like, for the setting in Brazil, I would doubt so. Uh, I mean, because why? Because the shareholders and the managers uh, basically take the same role. I mean, the, you have uh, the, the role of the controlling shareholder in Brazil. And for that, you know, I'm not sure if the managerial entrenchment would be uh, would be <coughs> in implied in a, in a higher or in a higher uh, G index or B index. So these are no. They, uh, we want to know basically. We want to align what the shareholders want with the manager wants. So that's the alignment that we want. I'm not sh quite sure if the G index and the B index could capture that. Uh, the first one, which I, I briefly discuss, is the benefit and limitation of using inform bonds. Well, so uh, basically, what uh, no, what uh, what the issuers we are talking about, what the issuers we are looking at. We have the. Uh, are we talking about recent entrants into the debt capital markets, or actually repeated issuers? Now, that's very key when we talk about uh, you know tapping the debt capital markets, and actually. Uh, uh, I'll talk about because basically you have a comparison. Are, are we comparison with the ba bank debt spreads, which actually uh, you know do measure the cost of debt? Or are we talking about fees? <coughs> At least my understanding uh, by reading the paper, we are talking about the fees, which is basically how much you know uh, you are leaving for investment bankers. You are basically you know uh, repricing because the market has changed. So these things, uh, you know, <coughs> um, might not get the, the, the right pricing or the right cost of that. Um, uh, second thing is on the, uh, the question which is, you know, the question that everybody uh, knows about, which is some shareholders might actually leverage on the, on the bondholders actually to, you know, uh, to monitor the company. And, uh, when you talk about the ATP, is that good for bondholders? I, I think so, but you know, I, if it depends if it, there is a change of control, which basically you know ATP does. Uh, you know, I, if the new shareholder is a is a better shareholder, I would say so. But if it's not, you know, what can we say? <coughs> 
The other thing is, uh, I think, the, the like uh, I already mentioned, which is the building reputation to access capital markets. Some, some do companies do tap the debt capital markets to access the equity markets. On the GIM and BDF index, so uh, we are talking quite a lot on ATPs, but uh, are we talking mostly when we talk about the 24 uh, index or the six index, we are talking mostly on governance rules. Which w so my question is, uh, do, do these rules actually benefit the bondholders? And to what extent? On the regression analysis, um, uh, you know, some 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 questions, and uh, I think the the market conditions uh, they do imply a lower higher fees. Uh, there is a dummy variable for that. I think one one possible alternative explanation for the variable coupon around a bond because there is a less risk for bondholders rather than zero coupon. So you know that might explain why you have a, a benefit by having a variable coupon uh, rather than a fixed coupon or a zero coupon. Uh, on the IPO debt issuers, we have I, I think that we have the same uh, issue as the equity IPO if you will have for uh, debt IPO. So you know there is some information symmetry, which would be, would be able to capture by simply including a dummy variable. You know, which will signal the c if the company is first time which is tapping the, uh, the capital markets. <coughs> On the covenants, uh, I, th I think you know by only putting a dummy for the covenants, we miss a lot of information because we don't know what covenant we are talking about. Are we talking about restrictive covenants uh, like? Uh, on financial leveraging, dividend payment, on investment side, on negative pledge. So we have a lot of information on covenants, and uh, what I miss here is you know, which covenants we are talking about. <coughs> the sample here mentions that 64% issues do, do have covenants, so I think that's uh, quite important to get the information on the covenants. On the credit rating, uh, we have 7% of the average of the issuers. They, they have all the issues that have a AAA equivalent rating. But you know, can we have a kind of scale uh, rather than j simply a dummy? Because you know, some some companies like a recent entrance to the debt capital markets. What they would like to get is not a triple A rating, but they would uh, probably look for a credit rating status. So they were looking for triple B, at least to access the debt capital markets before maybe getting an upgrade to triple A. <coughs> So I think uh, you no know, by by having you know, the like the scale in the in the credit rating would, would capture a lot of information. So by looking at the regression, I think it would be worth also to have some interaction among the variables between size effect, investment grade, for instance, and add the tenor and dummy for previous issues. Why tenor? Because you know if we spread the fees over ten years, is is different from spreading the fees over five years or 30 year ho horizon. So you know, the real cost is quite different uh, depending on the tenor. Uh, I like very much the robustness checks for the variables in the, the genetic issues. But you know, I would uh, I ask uh, why OAS, o -O uh, rather than GMM, including Logit. So uh, no, just, uh, and there is some very minor points, uh, like I said. Uh, there's some missing which I already discussed. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent comments. Thanks very much. I appreciate the help on our paper. Um, okay, I think the short term, long term, uh, certainly we can do that. Um, it might make the paper slightly different in terms of the, the referees would say what we're focusing on. So it might be a different paper. But I agree with you in terms of um, what the predictions might look like. Uh, probably slightly different, and I would agree. Um, in terms of bank capital versus uh, 144As, well, yeah, um, certainly the number of covenants, the spreads, the credit ratings, and obviously the uh, so-called proxy for first time versus uh, long time. If I did the that on all the companies and uh, just sliced out, you would actually, you know, you could see that. So I agree that would uh, do some of the work. Um, on the fees, I, I think uh, we can do all the things you uh, suggest. In ter and uh, obviously, I think uh, the timing question and, uh, uh, yeah, the good timing issues, we can, we can 
uh, sort that out. Um, in terms of um, um, the GIM index and what matters with respect to bondholders versus uh, equity holders, we've done that. Um, and uh, I did it before the crisis and after the crisis. So there's a couple papers out there that say governance matters to debt, and you can look at the same data set before and after the crisis, and then you can do a principal component analysis and then ordinal rank the ones that matter for bondholders and creditors. We did that, and there's not much difference. So that's, a, uh, I think, very important to see which ones matter, but ultimately there's a few adjustments, and the ones you suggest we would see that would actually be higher for uh, so-called large bondholders as opposed to equity, but fundamentally the ordering doesn't really, I think, uh, matter that much. Uh, in terms of um, um, at least the covenants, yeah, I, I, you're right, but it's a huge job. I think it's easier uh, the way we've done it. Um, I've sliced out, and we did it by hand, uh, 500 of these, which is a big job. I don't. Uh, maybe someone wants to come to Tilburg and do this as a summer thesis, the uh, other 8,500. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I can say is... Uh, uh, it's um, fairly predictable that there's fewer covenants by virtue of the number um, and this type of um, structure. I don't think I could improve too terribly on the work that's already been done on the type of covenants um, in articles recently in the field. So I do think it's something to do. I don't know if I could do it in a convincing enough way, but I think it's certainly the right thing to know what they are. Um, in terms of um, the declining triple A's and scaling down, sure, sure. Uh, I said that, in fact, that by the end of the period of 2009, yeah, there was you know, hardly any triple A's left. So in order for us to make sense of the difference uh, scaling down to in just below investment level would make sense. Um, and we could do the interaction effects, uh, size and uh, that. Uh, so I think that makes uh, a great deal of difference. Uh, the question ultimately is, um, will it come out much difference in terms of sh uh, the interaction effects? I don't think so. Um, but uh, these are great comments. Thanks very much. I appreciate them. Well, uh, for Professor McCarthy, um, uh, you were the presenter of both papers, and it's, it's interesting to see that in one of them, for uh, the equity market, you, you have considered that uh, for instance, dual class share structure was considered to be uh, uh, not so good governance practice. And uh, since, of course, you can uh, call it also an anti-takeover protection, <laughs> anti-takeover uh, provision, uh, um, how would you comment uh, and compare the results of both uh, studies? Um, my my guess, uh, if you allow me, uh, uh, would maybe be that uh, uh, because it doesn't surprise me that uh, for bondholders or for any investor, uh, uh, governance or bad governance uh, is a concern and should be uh, the reason for uh, um, higher cost of capital or fees, etc. What surprises me is that for the equities market, it could be considered not to be a requirement. And uh, in that sense, maybe uh, you would like to, to consider uh, the hypothesis of uh, a situation where investors uh, are liquid, very liquid, uh, yields are very low, uh, they are desperately looking for growth, and the companies that have growth to offer uh, are being able to leverage their positions, and entrepreneurs are being able to impose a standard uh, that maybe would not be acceptable in, in a different uh, market situation. Uh, prior to, to the crisis, uh, we've seen investors, uh, including here in Brazil, accepting anything uh, because liquidity was very high. So uh, I don't know if really, uh, and I'm not here uh, supporting uh, risk metrics uh, standards. I'm, I'm not fanatic. O on the contrary, uh, I, I agree. Uh, and I believe you have a very interesting uh, uh, way uh, to research uh, this issue. It's important to, to try to understand what's happening to the IPO markets. 
but uh, uh, I just would like to make this small location. Well, thank you very much. This is a very good question. And I'm not sure I'll give you a complete or satisfactory answer, but uh, perhaps one way to think about it is that at IPO stage, the um, dual class don't matter for the most part. And I think they don't really matter because probably until midstream or when a control issue is in effect, so a second uh, event, uh, they really don't have any information of uh, impact on the market for valuation. So I would say for uh, equity, um, if you look at all the uh, studies on information and the signal that uh, dual class have, then until there's a intermediate point where control or some other major transaction impacts value on investors, dual class are like any other charter provision as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's probably what the market uh, thinks when they value because, in fact, we know from a lot of studies is that at IPO, the charter provisions really are pretty irrelevant. So, um, but when it comes to uh, a debt market, 144A, uh, as you rightly say, I think there's a, a concern, this conflict between debt holders and uh, shareholders, and then uh, it certainly would click in to see which uh, issues matter. Well, whether in fact um, you can uh, force a, a haircut down uh, on someone or obliterate the uh, equity position of an investor by virtue of uh, changing the composition of the board by uh, effectively um, bringing in your favorite uh, new shareholder um, and giving your new shareholder a, a differential set of votes uh, in respect to how much they invest, I think that's a very big issue and I agree with you. So um, I, on the one hand, the IPO dual class don't matter until midstream or a control issue. And for most of the firms uh, in question, at least in the data set we have for the equity, that's not gonna be an issue, uh, I think. And uh, perhaps the uh, uh, real people who are uh, contesting uh, the question about these one share, one votes, which are the hedge funds and other institutional investors, they have not made that an issue. Uh, the question about uh, dual class. I think other people like Masoulis uh, have shown that, in fact, the dual class shares have a, a deleterious effect on the values of firms uh, overall. And I think that's uh, right. So, in fact, uh, across the board, I mean, if we take up on the aggregate, uh, they do have that effect. But for at least uh, two papers here, I would say probably there's not a great uh, uh, contradiction. So I, I take your point about the dual class and uh, what the long run, or at least the effect on aggregate might be. Uh, it's, a, it's a question for Professor McCarthy too. It's a, uh, it's a very simple question from an economist's point of view. Uh, could it be that the two papers are measuring two different things? Like uh, on, on the first paper, you're looking at the supply side. So uh, investors are willing to buy those shares despite the low governance, not because of the low governance. Uh, so the low governance is actually to get supply going, whereas the second paper is actually looking at demand. So this, is, I mean, the, the contradiction it is not there actually, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, you have different uh, streams, and so ultimately you're right, despite the governance. In fact, I think the governance uh, is not something the investors look at. So it's zero uh, at, you yeah. uh, Right. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. So, so you have kind of a life cycle story here, right? I mean, you you start off with the the IPO, and everybody cares about equity, and therefore nobody cares about the ATPs. Over time, everybody starts to care about short-term value the ATPs become superfluous and the cost of having the ATPs increases, right? So now you need your mechanism to finish the story. You need your mechanism to remove the ATPs, which I gather from your story is, is the hedge fund. Is that a, a fair summary of the, the life cycle picture that your two papers put together? Well, I don't do that, Randall, but uh, if I were to look at the so-called... How, how about an idea for a paper, then? <laughs> <laughs> if I were to look at your work on proxy uh, and other uh, uh, proposals, I would look at the number of proxy proposals that targeted those particular uh, corporate charters, and then I would look at the voting, abstention or not, and then I would see who the pro uh, opponents were, 
and see what the actual rate was in terms of success. And uh, what I might see from your work and others is that it really doesn't matter. Um, so indeed, uh, over time, when you have a mature firm, uh, indeed, the cost of carrying them only matters at the margin. And we're at the margin, it's where, in fact, there is a change of control situation. And we know from Brav and other data sets is that um, we get high premia where there is a change of control, particularly where the edgies uh, jump in. So that's where we might go for a proxy challenge, and they could be uh, the target. But they're usually not the target, interestingly. So if we take that life story and uh, bring it to its uh, ultimate, uh, we would say only on the rarest of deals where essentially the dual class shares matter and there's not an equivalent to measure, then yes, they would become very costly. And you would, pro you would either vote them out uh, through a challenge uh, or in fact um, some reverse uh, technique. Um, on, on the same point, another way to think about this is that at the IPO stage, what investors care about is is there, is there a competent management in place? Do they have a good idea? Do they have an entrepreneur? Do they have a leader who's going to take the business forward? And, uh, and that leader may very well want to be protected so that it, you know, they, they would, so we, we don't, it's a, it's a counterfactual. We don't know what uh, IPOs, uh, what, what would be the incentives of it, entrepreneurs to create a new company if they couldn't protect themselves a little bit by uh, by having a dual class structure or by having ATPs in place. We do know a lot of firms go, to, go, to, go public with the I ATPs in place, so my guess is it is serving some sort of important function at that stage. And then, of course, the question, and uh, it, it seems to me like a really interesting lifestyle kind of question is, okay, what changes over time to cause it to become important, and can we track the characteristics uh, that would, uh, that would it, it, Oh, and that happen over time with the firms to, to be able to predict at what point does it become a problem rather than a benefit to the company to have those things in place. Okay, that's a great question, Margaret. Um, if you think about it as a real option and you're going forward, you don't know the option value of the line of business because it's not, um, you can't get the value at the IPO stage. So let's assume a real option value um, alpha and maybe you need the ATP to protect the embedded right because you can't calculate in your IPO disclosure, then the ATP serves as a, uh, some kind of bargaining chip for those guys who may be forced out later. But I think that's rarely the case in most of these firms because um, when we go IPO, people actually have done those real options analysis to calculate what the upside is, if there is any. And you can see that in the warrants because the warrants will track that. So maybe another story, how about this one? Uh, looked at LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably one of the better run companies, um, had a fabulous IPO, and if you compare the LinkedIn versus Facebook experience, you probably want to go with LinkedIn. Um, and LinkedIn, you know, has suffered some unanticipated uh, roadblocks. And as a consequence, their control block holder, right, um, the one who had the most to lose, was forced out. Um, and it didn't change his view of the firm, which is he still wanted to make shareholder value and growth the issue. And I really think the ATP was uh, not here nor there. It was, in fact, he being the largest uh, uh, stockholder and wanting the growth story to continue, recognize that he had to go, uh, as opposed to uh, so-called disciplining the forces and using the ATP. So I would go to the literature and say that there's a declining value of these mechanisms. Nevertheless, they still have a kind of a predictive value, but they're really not the work that's going on in the market today. The fact that LinkedIn shares were being shorted and the threat that they would continue to be shorted uh, was as much or more uh, the issue that was going on. And I think the legal protection or the signal from the legal protection uh, would have done little uh, to thwart the actual change. So he did it voluntarily for the best interest of the company. I think in a competitive market, blockholders will do that. And maybe a market like uh, Brazil, where there's not a competitive market for, let's say, block shares or options on block shares, it probably doesn't happen. So that, I mean, so I do take the force of your argument. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Yeah, sure. um, so um, I really enjoyed both your papers. Now, one um, on the IPO and growth paper, so one of the consequences of listing is becoming subject to Rule 10b-5. Uh, 
And I was wondering to what extent you have any thoughts as to the disciplining influence of 10b5 on governance of these listed firms, even though they may not necessarily be having that sort of uh, super class governance structure that, that, that sort of you discuss. So what is the disciplining influence potentially of rule 10b5? The potential for sort of heightened disclosure standards to make these guys more amenable to activist advances, for example, um, and potential sort of costs involved in that in that direction. Okay, that's a great question. I don't know if I know the answer, but maybe if I can track on, let's assume Merritt Fox and people like him are right, that uh, 10b-5 has this governance quality and that you can actually see uh, that firms will allocate investments according to the quality of the disclosures in the 10b-5 and the threat uh, from an action. Then perhaps then you'll want to disclose in a particular way so you can ensure that your capital costs uh, won't be impacted. Um, on the other hand, I'm not really too sure that these firms matter or worry about it too much. For example, um, if we were really concerned about these statements, why wouldn't we have, um, let's say, the statements that are given in the 13 Ds by investors uh, who make uh, claims about their investment, uh, which impact the shares? Wouldn't we want to have those under 10b-5? Those have, have had a lot of impact in terms of the returns, the short-run returns, not, not so much the long-run returns. And most economists are concerned about what the impact will be when someone makes an investment that has uh, a large stake in the firm. So maybe I would want those statements regulated by, for example, uh, our favorite uh, Third Avenue and whatever investors in New York. So I think if we're concerned, we'd be concerned across the so-called life cycle of statements. So I think the 10b-5 we can probably ensure, and we do. But in fact, that all the statements that affect both the on the positive and negative side might be in place. So I think the normal insurance effects will cover 10b-5. Um, but maybe I would like to extend uh, <laughs> this type of thing for the hedgies so they can make the right statements as well about what their impact is so that the market doesn't take a, uh, a distorted view. Same way with the investor conferences. They're not uh, under any type of uh, anti-fraud liability. And we know from other studies that the so-called one-to-ones um, give pregnant market-specific information that are intended to actually outrun the FD standard. Shouldn't those be regulated by similar types of fraud standards? I think so. So my sense is that you would fill the box in as opposed to just rely on the 10b-5. But that's just sort of my amateur view. I'm not really a securities lawyer. Thank you.